Monica can get us started. Great. Um, well, it's so great to see everyone coming in and getting situated here. Um, welcome to the second core session of the Reimagining Assessment Practicum. Um, the title of our session is When and Where We Might Implement Alternative Grading Strategies. So we're excited to see um, how you've done that or um, give you an opportunity to try it out for yourself if you haven't already. Um, my name is Veronica Burns. I'm an associate professor of instruction in chemistry, and I'm here with uh, my colleagues, Lori. Hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Lori Dietz, and I'm the director of pedagogy and curricular development at the Searle Center, and I am super excited about this topic, one of my favorite topics. So thank you all for being here. Good morning. I'm Reggie Jackson. I'm the Director of Teaching Excellence at uh, Medill School of Journalism and also Lead, Engin lead Learning Engineer at uh, NUIT's uh, Teaching and Learning Technologies. And I'm also very happy to be here today to talk about grading. So uh, what we want you to do is, if you can put into the chat, you can put your name, pronouns, role and department and three words that describe how you feel about grading. Do not hit send or enter until we say go. Seeing all these words. Mm -hmm. Curious, that's a great one. Stress, definitely. <laughs> Mixed feelings, I think that's a great way to describe it as well. Seems like there's a lot of mixed words that we're yes here. Onerous, drudgery. Arbitrary. <laughs> Restrictive. Oh. I hate oh, giving yes. Yeah. Onerous. Wow, that's a good one. <laughs> oh, these are great. Thank you all uh, for sharing these. And seeing all the range of emotions that people have about grades, it's probably a great opportunity to remind you all of our participation guidelines for the practicum, which really is about uh, remembering that we all come from different experiences and feelings. And so to approach our conversations, even when we have um, really strong opinions and strong feelings with curiosity uh, and to assume those positive intents um, and as we engage in our conversations today and throughout the practicum. We also have a feedback and insight board that we're using in the practicum to collect your feedback as we go. I think Un can supply a link and there, it's also available through the Canvas site, uh, but we love any of your feedback. So as we continue through the practicum, we're at about the halfway point. So congratulations, everyone, that we can capture it um, for the remaining time we have together, but then also as we think ahead to future iterations too. And I also just really want to do a special plug for our consultant, Melissa Co. I had the very good fortune of working with Melissa when we were both at Stanford, and she is absolutely fabulous and wonderful. Um, she's currently at UC Berkeley in their Center for Teaching and Learning in a role focused on equity and assessment. She's exactly the kind of person that I turn to when I have questions around assessment and grading and really any any teaching topic. She and I, we really survived the pandemic together. So uh, if you haven't made an appointment with her yet, I would really, really recommend it. And yes, so back to our session. Yeah, so we sort of centered this session on um, some guiding questions here. Um, first, we'll tackle how grades can demotivate learning and maybe what can we do about it and how could we potentially address some of those problems. Um, so what are some assessment frameworks that will decenter grading in effort to um, resolve those issues that, that grades bring with them? And then um, we're going to spend the most of our time on this last point, which is how might um, those alternative grading frameworks apply to you and your um, classroom experiences. So um, 
I really invite you to, to use this time to imagine for yourself. It's called the reimagining assessment practicum. So we're really leaning into that imagination part. Um, and we're going to invite you to imagine different possibilities for what your classroom could look like under these different types of um, grading frameworks. So we'll start off with talking about the problems with grades. Um, we'll go through our way of thinking about all these different frameworks. You've probably heard names of some of them or even tried some of them in your courses, but how do they all fit together? How do we sort of parse that out? And then we'll go into three separate um, uh, frameworks that are, are often used, contract grading, specifications grading, and ungrading. And we'll give you a chance after each description to reimagine your own course and talk in a breakout session and really um, start to think about how these ideas could possibly apply to, um, to you and your, uh, your classroom. I think today is really about you know, the way that grades impact students, absolutely. But there's also the way that grades impact instructors. As we saw in the chat, we have a lot of emotions about grading. Um, and so I invite you to consider your own development for a moment and how we learn and we grow and change as instructors and give yourself this opportunity to um, reimagine assessment in your class. So the problems with grades. Um, so this is a summary slide of many of the themes and the points of consensus that are in the research and scholarship around grading and especially how they connect to learning motivation. If you attended Robert Talbert's keynote, he really hit on a lot of these. And so we just wanted to bring them back here with a special emphasis for today's conversation on that top middle one about how grades can really discourage experimentation and risk taking. And I think that's particularly important to think about within the context of Northwestern students. Northwestern students are very high achieving, right? They are students who got to Northwestern because they were so good at getting good grades. So oftentimes their identities really get attached to those grades, as I'm sure uh, you all can relate to if you've taught a Northwestern class. And, and the problem with that, right, this kind of goes to Carol Dweck's research on fixed mindsets, is that if the, our identities get so wrapped up in being an A student, then we're less likely to take those chances to really grow and to push ourselves and learn. And so if we can push grades out of the picture for as long as possible, then we give Northwestern students that gift to really grow and reach beyond any potential that they even thought might have been possible for themselves. And in addition, and I can speak about this from personal experience into what Veronica was saying about this also being about our experience as instructors. I know that when I, I use a lot of contract grading, which we'll get into more specifics later, but it has really allowed me to do more experimentation as an instructor, because I know that if an assignment doesn't quite work out, students' grades and that murkiness aren't like dependent upon it. It's part of a bigger picture and we're all kind of learning together. And so I feel like I've really come up with some of my most innovative learning experience for students because I've had that freedom and flexibility to work within some of these alternative grading structures. And then finally, that last point on the slide, that the biggest issue and one of the reasons why we wanted to build this whole practicum around assessment is that grades stop the continuous improvement process. That is what the research just shows hands down. The second we put a number or we put a letter grade on something, learning is done. It doesn't really matter how much feedback accompanies those grades, it ends the process. And what we really wanna do is embrace that idea that we are lifelong learners and that we want students and us, right, to learn for as much as we can for as long as we can until we're kind of forced, right, at the end of the term then to settle up with a grade. So these are gonna be some of the, the points that we kind of go back to as we look at different alternative grading frameworks. So there are lots of uh, frameworks available and uh, they can be a little bit confusing but they overlap and intersect as you see here on the slide. So today what we're gonna do is we're gonna break down, break these down specifically for you and then give you an opportunity to try on 
like grading schemes and uh, through discussions with uh, your peers here. So the big picture here is what decisions you have to make and how does this narrow down the options for you to incorporate this in your particular class? So none of the options are binary. Uh, they are like on a sliding scale. So what do students, where do students demonstrate learning? Labor-based, uh, learning how to bake croissants, so learning is in that process, or standards-based, where students meeting benchmarks, so you give them three attempts to meet the standard that you've set for them in, the, uh, in your, uh, on the uh, specific assignment. And we can add to Reggie's spectrum of labor-based versus standards-based to uh, a scale of high agency where students have a lot of control and um, a lot of decision-making power or low agency where students are um, decentered in that. And so you can think about these two as, as intersecting um, spectrums and we've kind of created four different quadrants here. So you might feel immediately that you're aligned to one quadrant or another, but we're going to ask you to um, shift your perspective around and try out different uh, places on this diagram for yourself and for your class and to see what's, what's out there and just sort of um, explore a little bit. So as we head into uh, take a deeper dive into three different frameworks, uh, more uh, closely. Just want to, again, remind that this is really about that kind of sandbox mode of play and experimentation. And whether this is your first time considering incorporating alternative grading, or you're coming in with lots of experience or thinking of maybe ways to adapt or adjust, I just want to remind you that uh, with change, right, it starts small, that uh, alternative grading frameworks, and we're going to show you how they've really um, transformed at the course level, but you can absolutely apply them to a specific assignment or you know, part of your overall kind of course grades. I know that's where I started was with just one portfolio assignment within a class. Um, and so there's really many ways in, and that's what connects to the second point, that what I, we all really love about these frameworks and what Talbert's Venn diagram, I think, really highlights is that this is about mix and match. This is about customization for what works best for you, for your learning outcomes and for your students. And so that is where a lot of the play and experimentation comes is in really figuring out what is the right customization for your context. So first we're gonna go through contract grading. And so we have a definition for contract grading. So grading contracts seek to, seek to authorize students to take as much control over their lives as possible as individuals and as a community. So in practice, sorry, in practice, uh, tax-based grading uh, framework that invites students to select what to complete based on their grade goals and then tasks are preset by the instructor. And so they're negotiated between the student and the instructor and or agreed upon by like a, cl a class community. And then final grades determined wholly by contract or supplemented with instructor or student evaluation of the quality of their work in the class. So here's a good definition of labor-based grading. A uh, labor-based contract calculates the final course grades purely by the labor students complete, not by any judgments of the quality or their writing. And as you can see, contracts falls in this, uh, on the side of labor-based and then lower agency. So we did a case study. We did a couple. We did some case studies here, and uh, I talked to uh, Patty Walter, who is a faculty member in uh, the Medill School of Journalism, and uh, I talked to her about her class, uh, her magazine editing class, which was uh, Journalism three eleven, and um, Patty's motivation for uh, making a change in her course. Um, she decided to create a contract for the students, and she put this all in the syllabus. And so one of the things is some of the things that she's talked that she talked to me about were her concerned about the importance of grades 
and uh, goals to lower the pressure and focus on the learning. And she's taught classes where she has, uh, for 12 years where she had classes which was pass and fail. And then she also believes in decoupling learning from the grades. So here's Patty's uh, kind of framing of this, and I'm not gonna read this for you, but some of the some of the highlights associated with this is that she changed her some of her grading processes to check, check plus, and check minus. And she did this for her kind of uh, formative assignments. And then for her summative assignments, she made those as letter grades. So students, the, when she did those formative assignments, they were able to submit multiple times and get really good feedback on what she was trying to uh, teach them in the class. So that was like, that lowered the pressure on them in terms of what they were doing in the class. And she did this as for the whole class and not just one assignment. This was her whole class process for this. So this is her syllabus statement when she talked about her, uh, how you would get a B or A minus or an A. And this is included in the syllabus. This is part of that contract there. So you had to get so many check pluses or check minuses or checks in order to get the grade that you wanted to get. You had to attend class, you know, as, uh, you know, pretty much as many of the classes too, in order to get the grades that you wanted as well. But she also had uh, parameters there about the, your checks and check minuses and check pluses in order for students to know exactly what they would get in the class at the very end. And student, it was up to students to determine what they wanted to get in her class. And some of her responses uh, from students was, there was one student who said they wanted to get a B. And the reason they wanted a B in the class and they, uh, they had some outside issues that were going on. And they told her that if we had had a traditional grading, traditional grading in this class, I would have had to drop the class. But this format allowed me to pick what I wanted and I was able to achieve a B in the class because that's where I was at that point in my in school that I needed to just get a B in this particular class. And she had another student that says, that she appreciated the amount of feedback she got in the class because the amount of feedback was for each assignment, she could write it, turn it in, get feedback, write it again, and turn it in as often as she wanted to in order to get the, uh, the score that she wanted to. But she said, because of the feedback, she said she was uh, able to really, really learn more about her writing and editing in that process. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put you in uh, groups. I think we have time um, if there are any general yeah. questions about contract grading before we send you yes. into uh, groups for discussion, which is great. You can put those questions in the chat. So So here's what you're gonna do in your small groups. Um, you're gonna get, well, you know, you're gonna discuss um, if you have implemented labor-based contract grading in your class, what did you, what did you, what did, what, what you did and how it went. And then if you have not tried it, um, you might, what might it look like in your class? You know, would you apply it to one aspect of your class or would you do it for the whole class? You know, what would be the potential benefits for students and you, and what are the potential challenges and concerns? So we're going to work in the same groups throughout the, uh, for each one of these breakouts we do today. So this one is going to be for uh, 15 minutes. So I'm going to open the rooms now and let you in. And wanted to just give a couple minutes here to invite any sharing out. Um, what questions came up that you want to surface with the group or any insights, examples that uh, you talked about in your group that you think would benefit us all? Can either um, just jump off. Well, let's start talking about specifications grading. Um, this is another uh, format that is, you'll see a lot of overlap with some of the ideas from contract grading, but it, it flips it a little bit. So um, this is a quote from Linda Nilsson, who uh, kind of wrote the book on specifications grading. And she says, 
Um, faculty can set and enforce whatever expectations they can clearly articulate to their students and enable them to meet. Specifications grading or specs grading um, provides the framework for doing this without raising the ire of students. Um, I do specs grading in my course and I, I pretty much agree with this. I would say the most important part of this quote is um, we can set and enforce what I, whatever expectations we can clearly articulate. The clear articulation is really key here and that'll be a theme of um, the case study that we're doing here. So in practice, what is specifications grading? You're going to take your course and break it down into categories of achievement. Um, and you can link those to course objectives. Maybe it's by chapter, maybe it's by um, concept, by idea or learning objective, things that you want them to be able to do. Um, but you're breaking the course down into different categories. And then within each category, you set a goal post and you say, you must achieve this bar in category one and this bar in category two and three and four. Um, and so for each category, the achievements for an A, a B, a C are all outlined ahead of time. And it's similar to contract grading in that way that you're setting the expectations for what certain letter grades look like. But here it's based on what students are achieving and that that bar of achievement is set and less on how many assignments are completed, less checking boxes and more based on um, performance. So their student performance at the end of the quarter is compared to those preset goalposts and then a grade would be assigned accordingly. Um, every student in specifications grading has the opportunity to make progress towards these goalposts. Notice we're comparing to a goalpost, to a specific way of um, evaluating the performance and not comparing to other students in any way. So that is something I always stress with my students. You're not being compared to each other, you're being compared to a set of standards and that's inherent in specifications grading. And so here, if we're thinking about the quad diagram thing, the example you're about to see falls into that lower corner, um, standards-based, because it is about setting those standards of achievement and where we want a student to be at the end of the quarter. And it's low agency because I'm the one setting those standards. <laughs> and um, you could imagine other uh, examples of specifications where students have a little bit more agency. But for this example, we're in that lower corner. And this case study, you see my face over here, but <laughs> um, I've done all this work uh, with my colleague, Katie Gesmundo. Um, she's, you know, my right hand kind of thing. Um, we're both the uh, co-directors of General Chemistry Laboratories. So this work was done in a, a STEM laboratory class. And um, to those of you in other fields, laboratory courses are often evaluated a lot by writing. So I think there's a lot of overlap with um, lab courses, and many other types of courses on campus. And so what we started off with this, and we said, this was full disclosure during the pandemic, and we really had to sit and look in the mirror for a little while and decide, what does it mean to take a lab course? Um, particularly during a pandemic, what does it mean to take a lab course? But even after the pandemic was over, um, we used our brainstorming from that time to reshape what our course looked like. So, you know, what do we want students to be able to get out of um, a laboratory course? And we made a list of things, some of those things, lab techniques, um, data analysis, those, you know, were, were our tent poles here. And each of those, uh, what do we want students to get out of the course? Each of those ended up turning into a category in our grading scheme. And our grading scheme shaped what the assignments looked like. So we really cleared the deck and we said, we're gonna start the course all over from what do we want students to get out of the class and allowed that to shape the way the course is graded and allowed that to shape the assignments. So something like lab techniques that translated into a category called safety and techniques, and that appears on every assignment that students turn in. They answer a question about safety and techniques. Um, science writing experience, that turned into a writing focus question. 
Lori, thank you. Um, and so the chart that students get to, to keep track of their grade over the whole quarter um, has each of these categories that we're uh, that we've described to them, safety and techniques, experimental design, et cetera. And um, every assignment is uh, uh, listed as a column. So as students complete assignments, they're tackling one of each category, one of each question type um, in that single assignment. And then they do it four times because there are four assignments overall. So as they progress through the quarter, they're progressing through each category and they can actually chart how well they are doing and how well they are achieving through each category on this on this diagram. And they'll fill in the empty boxes as they turn in the first, second and third and fourth assignments. And so then it's it's immediate feedback to them that they can see, oh, um, I'm doing really well in the safety and techniques category. Um, but uh, when it comes to data analysis, I think I need a little bit more help here because my my um, progress doesn't look as great. So they're able to reflect on it themselves. Um, and another fun aspect of my class is that um, in general chemistry, we have over 500, maybe 600 students um, a quarter take our classes. So um, TAs are the ones who are executing the grading. And that can make people shy away from um, trying out new ways of, of tackling grading as TAs are the ones who have to execute this. Um, but we have been able to uh, clearly communicate expectations to the TAs. And that's been, that's been key. Um, we've had to reevaluate the way that we do it a number of times, but, you know, it's a, pro a process and um, uh, it's, always getting better is kind of the, the continuous improvement that we talked about at the beginning. So we have rubrics that um, image on the previous yeah. slide was a rubric of what we would give to a TA who's going to do the assessment. Um, and that clear communication is paired with um, weekly meetings and all kinds of other um, helpful things that we've developed for the TAs who are doing the grading. So ultimately, students are building their own report card for the class and the categories of each um, of each letter grade that they get on their report card are the skills that I want them to have. So at the end of the day, they're able to see, oh, I do really well in experimental design. I have an A in that category, but I have a C in writing style. So I think I should go to the writing center and pick up some skills there. And then they have actionable ways to address um, their shortcomings. Student responses to this have been overwhelmingly positive. Um, students see this as a fair evaluation method. Um, they do really connect it to um, being encouraging for their improvement and giving them the skills they need to identify where they need to improve or what actions they can take. Um, this comment warms my heart that taking this course has made me realize what a lab actually is, that we're, we've truly connected you know, what we want students to get out of the lab to the student experience. And that was really important to us. And then we have a negative comment here too. We've got an, a couple of those along the way, um, but this one says that some TAs can be more lenient and others can be more strict. So that really points out that this is very TA dependent and we've put a lot of effort into um, improving that. And we really see that as um, a, a point that we are continually looking to, to make better. So as you move into, oh, we have a question in the chat here. Um, do students see the rubric as well as the task? Um, students do not see the TA facing rubric. Um, students are told what the expectations are for, um, we have something similar to what Patty has, like the check, check, plus, check, minus thing. We call it excellent, good, and not quite, meaning not quite meeting the expectations. So we have definitions for what those three categories mean, but we don't give them specifics about what we are looking for in the answer to each question, because that itself is kind of a hidden learning objective of getting them to um, uh, elevate their work to a, a, a 
deep thinking sort of level. Really wonderful discussion. Um, students oftentimes focus on what they have done wrong rather than holding onto the areas they are doing well. That is very true. Um, is there a way we can help students see both and celebrate where they are doing well? Yeah, I mean, I think it takes um, having that conversation transparently during class. And for my class, at least, we have um, kind of a document that connects, okay, this, this, and this mean an A in the course, this, this, and this mean a B. And um, taking some time out of class to go through that document really helps students um, make those connections and realize, oh, I can make mistakes and it's okay. It also helps highlight for them what they are doing well and give them kind of a pat on the back in that category. Um, it's also helped me to have a mid-quarter reflection. Um, so students are asked halfway through the class to um, calculate their grade so far and what they're on track for. And then they are confronted with, <laughs> okay, here's the areas I want to improve and here's the things I'm doing well. And so both come to light at that same time with a, with kind of a metacognitive bend to it, which is nice. Um, discuss different levels of skill, um, which may involve feedback. Yeah, uh, more integrative skills may require a more elaborate description. Definitely. Um, there's a whole section next week on feedback and how to tailor the feedback to your course um, and, and how to give good feedback to students. Okay, great. So let's hear about our last category. It's ungrading. Um, Lori? So ungrading. So this is a term that can be a bit squishy. I think sometimes ungrading is used as a synonym for all alternative grading. But really, when you look a little more closely at the literature, what it's really trying to do is, is uh, minimize instructor agency as much as possible, even to the extent where they are not grading at all. That, And uh, this is a definition coming from Jesse Stommel, who is one of the big proponents of ungrading, that it's ultimately about student self-assessment, um, that they're the ones who then do the work of reflecting critically on their own learning and then providing evaluation. Because the idea is that you know best as the learner, you know when you've learned, right? Like part of it, it's so internal to know when someone is actually learning, just performing. And so why not then have that evaluation process um, go to the student. So in practice, what ungrading or this kind of self-assessment, self-grading looks like is that uh, many times students are setting some, if not all of those of their learning outcomes. So again, like pushing towards that high agency side of our graphic um, and that they are then regularly reflecting on their progress. So that real kind of metacognitive um, approach is embedded within the fabric of the course. Uh, the instructor then is really providing so much feedback, which again, we're not really getting into specific feedback strategies today, but next week we'll really focus on different ways of approaching feedback. And so you really become the coach in this environment because it's really hard to self-assess well. There's all sorts of great psychology research out there about how bad people are at self-assessment. And um, and so a, a, we can improve that a lot. And part of it is being able to make our own predictive models of how we learn and how we perform and what environments and what contexts. And that re often requires a lot of coaching. So that becomes a big role of the instructor in it. And then the students at the end, they are the ones who determine their final grade um, based on all that self-evaluation and often on a final um, kind of uh, structured reflection. And um, the instructor is still the one who's going to have to enter it into the book of record. And so often there will be a little caveat that they will adjust the grade if needed. And I'll say in everything that I've read or anyone I've talked to who's used ungrading, I've only heard instructors say that if they've had to make an adjustment, it is to adjust the grade up. 
because students can be really, really um, self-critical and the instructor shall, can see their progress more and wanna give them the benefit of the doubt there. So in the case study that we're gonna look at right now for ungrading, this is falling in that upper right quadrant that it's a more standards-based approach, but it's giving students very high agency. The students are doing a lot of the setting of their own goals in this um, case study. And then of course, they're also determining um, their grades uh, pretty much solely. If you attended the student panel session with Megan Fritz um, last week, uh, hers would also fall in this upper quadrant where students were doing a lot of setting of their own goals, wellness goals um, specifically. So I'm bringing you Trish Breeder. Um, uh, I worked with Trish in the spring. And what I really love about it, this example is that this was the first time that Trish was experimenting with an alternative grading framework. And she was really motivated by wanting to create a more equitable um, classroom environment and to do, reduce stress around grades for students that she was really noticing a lot of that anxiety. And she was like, what can I do? to reduce stress and provide a more equitable context. She had gone to um, a workshop on ungrading and had read Susan Blum's kind of famous chapter out of the book that she edited on ungrading. And so it's like, she was like, ready, let's take the plunge. And so it was a lot of fun working with her um, as she uh, applied this to her literature class. So I just wanted to give you the framework that she put in her syllabus and very similar to Patty's, right? She is grounding this in the research, letting students know that this is coming from an evidence-based practice. And what I also really like about how um, Trish is framing this for her students is that she's really centering the values that she cares about here. Um, it, she's, she tells them it's because she cares about equity. She tells them it's because she cares about their learning and really wants to create that environment for them to take risks, to experiment, and to really grow, and that she's there to support them all the way. Uh, she has them do to you know, write some of their own goals. She does conferences at the beginning. They're doing reflections on their progress towards those goals throughout. And then she ends very much um, borrowing or you know, adapting. Susan Blum in her chapter in the ungrading book has an example of a end of term self-evaluation. And so Trish took that as her starting point and then adapted it for her own needs. And this is an abbreviated version, but there are essentially four steps to the student's self-assessment, um, gathering materials, and then re really using those materials to reflect on. So you can see, even though Trish didn't do this formally, how an ungrading um, approach works really well in a portfolio-based class. That process of curation and reflection is really at the heart of what making a portfolio is. And so then she asked them to reflect in those two specific areas that are really at the heart of, of where she was doing some of the negotiating of learning outcomes around engagement and learning. Um, but then they're also folding in their own reflections on their uh, the student set learning outcomes there. And then finally asking them to assess. And she just very short I think she said there were like maybe 10 or 15 minute conferences at the end where they bring in their reflection and they do a quick kind of touching base and uh, discussing what the students said for their final um, for their final grade. Her students, uh, you know, so this was the first time that she ran this and she got really positive feedback uh, that were again, students like just as the research says that they should, that they were reporting better engagement, uh, more attention to learning, actually, you know, kind of that focus and caring about learning. She did have a couple students, though, and especially early on, who found it stressful to come up with their own goals and found it stressful to be the ones to, to do the grading, which I think makes a lot of sense. We all share the stress around that, right? And so, um, so, so even though that was one of her goals was to reduce stress, uh, she did notice some of that stress appearing early on, but said that it got better over time as the as they worked on it as a community and it became more normalized. So we've got time for uh, say about five minutes in a 
final breakout session to discuss ungrading. Before you head in, I just any quick questions for clarifying about what ungrading is and how it works. All right, let's uh, give you five more minutes of chatting and then we'll come back and wrap everything up. One, uh, we are just out of time. Thank you all for joining us today. And as next steps, reach out to Melissa. She's amazing for a consultation to talk more. Go to Lena's session on Thursday about co-creating rubrics. And then join Megan and me at the Learning Lab. And we're going to see if we can get someone from TLT to join us to talk specifically about Canvas. But it's a great place to come if you are interested in moving from theory to practice. So we'll get it all done together. So it's been a pleasure. And we will see you at the next session. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much for joining us today.